I filed evictions yesterday. We will continue to file evictions. There's a lot of confusion out there uh, as far as the property management, rental property industry, and how us landlords and property managers are supposed to handle the coronavirus pandemic. Some people are out there saying that evictions are completely outlawed. What can we as landlords and rental property owners do to navigate the coronavirus pandemic and keep our businesses afloat? We brought in a special guest, the Director of Compliance from US Reeb, to break down a lot of the legalities and steps that landlords can take to best get through this thing. Let's take a look. So you're the Director of Compliance at US Reeb. What, what exactly does that mean for the viewers out there? Because like, you know, you're you're going to be answering some pretty interesting technical questions for us during this COVID-19 crisis. Everyone's freaking out. So why, like, why should we listen to you? Okay. So my background as director of compliance, I really handle all of the fair housing, the legal aspect of property management and our company. So what I'm looking at is not so much the sales side and the investor side, but I'm looking at making sure we do things correctly, making sure we do things that are outlined with the state, with the city, ordinances, mandates that we have, especially now, and making sure that we're pretty much following all of the legal parameters that we need to, to make sure we keep ourselves safe and our investors safe. Good. That's that's incredibly important because it's like a it feels like a legal like landmine uh, landmine field or whatever I'm trying to say out there right now. Like it's just uh, it's a mess, right? And I think one of the biggest things that's very confusing um, to everybody is the current hold on evictions, right? Some right. people take that to mean that like evictions you can't evict people and tenants don't have to pay rent, but that's not the case, correct? That is not the case. We filed, I filed evictions yesterday. We will continue to file evictions. We will continue to work with tenants as we can. Um, the hold is just saying that the courts are not open. There's no docket. There's no judge there that's going to hear your eviction case, but that doesn't mean that it can't be filed. We e-file evictions like most states do. So they're going in every day. What's gonna happen is that once they do open in the next two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, that those are all gonna pile up and the individuals are unfortunately going to be in a worse place than they are today because those fees they don't stop so explain to me the exact specific legal differences right let's just say i'm a brand new investor and i've heard that there is no hold on evictions should should i wait until after they release that hold to file my eviction or should i file it today Today, absolutely. Um, business as usual on our side as far as filing. Now in the court, basically when they say a hold on evictions, they're just saying we're not going to give you a court date yet. We're not going to put you on a docket and have a judge listen to this, you know, until this um, 150 day or whatever in that um, jurisdiction the hold is. Um, but the evictions should be filed immediately. Do not wait. And what would happen if I were to wait? Like if I can't actually get my case heard right now because I got some tenant who's not paying rent, what's the benefit of, of me filing it today, as you say, business as usual, versus just waiting till the dust settles? Yes. If they can't do anything, why should I wait? Right. Well, the first thing it's going to do, is going to put you at the back of the line for a court date. So if you do wait and you do file when it's over, you're another three months behind because they're still trying to catch up on the evictions that were filed. The other thing is that you already set those um, parameters in place. So the tenants are then on notice that that has been filed. And a lot of times what I see is that the tenants are more willing to make arrangements when they know that we're following the process and that we're, it's not just a free rent month. <laughs> As far as uh, the stimulus programs that are out there right now, right? I know a lot of people have been getting their, their $1,200 stimulus check, uh, but for you know many folks, right, that's, that's not enough to, mm -hmm. to totally change their lives, right? If you're gonna be out of work two, three months, like you know the, the hardest hit folks, I'm thinking of uh, you know, our, our restaurant workers, servers, right. movie theater folks, you know, they're out of rent for, for a while, um, is there 
anything else in addition to that $1,200 that we as landlords uh, could, could, you know, direct our tenants towards because, you know, they're looking for somebody to help them out. But a lot of tenants just want to default and think that landlords are going to be their, their safety net or their resource. But, you know, that's obviously not our goal. We have businesses to run too. So you have any insight on where investors can, um, you know, send their tenants to try to get that assistance outside of that 1200 bucks? Yes, absolutely. I think that the $1,200 is great. You know, that's going to put some money in individuals' pockets. I don't necessarily feel like the tenants are going to use that to pay rent. I feel like they're going to use that as their own cushion. So what we've done is that we tried to kind of get ahead of the game. We contacted personally every single resource in our cities. Um, the um, charity groups, the renters assistance groups, even LEAP, low income housing assistance. Um, and there are those offices in every single municipality, every single city. We contacted them and said, hey, we're going to have, you know, 900 individuals that may or not be able to pay their rent. What resources do you have? We established a contact with them. So that when our tenants asked us, we didn't just give them a website or a phone number, we were able to give them a specific contact and say, call this person, let them know that you rent from us, and let them know that you're going to be having difficulty paying your rent so that they can provide some resources. What that does is it keeps us involved. Um, that organization may call us and say, hey, I did talk to your tenant. We are going to be helping them. So if you can't, you know, if you don't have to file eviction, don't. We just need to get it approved or processed. Um, so we gave all of our tenants a full list of all of our local and state resources in addition to a link that they can go online and find resources themselves as well. And that's great. And folks, we're going to have all of those links that CJ is talking about. They'll be in the show notes below uh, for you all to click on to see if you can find that assistance. And as far as like the number of uh, folks you guys are are dealing with that are having difficulty paying. Like for instance, up, up here in Cleveland, our portfolio, uh, on average, you know, some months are gonna be better than others, but on average, it, it looks like Holton Wise, we're probably evicting approximately 10 people a month. And right now, uh, end of April, we are seeing, I had to make sure it was April. I had to count on my fingers there. <laughs> we are, I'm, I'm sitting at home. It's hard. I don't even know what day it is right now. Is it Tuesday? Is it Thursday? I don't know. You know, this is crazy being out of the office. But right now, end of April, we're, we're, we're probably about, you know, double. Uh, it's looking like double. We're going to evict probably, well, we're not going to evict anybody today, but, you know, we're, we're on the same page as you. We're filing uh, so we don't get pushed to the back of the line. But it looks like we're going to end up with 20 folks that uh, can't make payment uh, as opposed to our normal 10. So just right around double is what we're seeing. What are, what are you guys seeing? I know some people are thinking the, the wheels are going to fall off and, you know, they're going to see 10 times the amount of non-payment. What are you guys seeing in your portfolio? As far as the evictions and what we're seeing as far as tenants not paying rent, surprisingly, our numbers are lower. We're actually getting rent in the door. I think that's due to the fact that we have been communicating with tenants from day one. Um, it, sometimes a tenant will feel like I have no option. Either I pay my full rent or I pay nothing. We're giving them that middle ground to say, hey, can you pay half? Can, you, can we waive some late fees? Can we work with you? When, when's your payday? So we're kind of becoming a partner right now with them and working some things out. Um, just yesterday, I've had a tenant that said, I'm moving out at the end of the month because I lost my job. I called her, hey, tell me what's going on. Have you filed for unemployment? Do you know that you have these resources? She signed another year's lease. She got her rent caught up. And we're, I think that individuals are just nervous. They don't know what to do. So if you can lead them to kind of understanding their options, then you're going to get that rent in the door. As landlords, you know what I see, what we typically like to do and what is the most efficient way to run our businesses as we, we usually have like, a, you know, our, our rules are set in stone and we have a zero tolerance policy for non-payment of rent. But this is, this is just completely unprecedented, uh, mm -hmm. unprecedented times, you know, I mean, it's just totally different. What was the conversation like between you and the, the rest of the ownership group of your company to decide, like, what, when did you guys decide to make the shift of, hey, 
you know, everything's black and white. So we have to adapt to this new situation and we have to try to become more of that partner with the tenants. Like how'd that conversation come about? Right. So, and there was a conversation and we did have a meeting because from my um, position as director of compliance, my first thought was absolutely not. We go by the book and we have to, you know, do everything exactly as we have. And then we started kind of thinking about that. We started looking at, okay, what are we really trying to accomplish um, as a company and as a part of the community? And what we've done is that we looked at all of our um, leases, our guidelines. Whatever you do, you have to do it across the board. So that's my only advice as far as compliance. If you say that we're going to waive rents or waive late fees, excuse me, then you waive late fees for everyone in that situation. And that's an amazing point. And that goes to fair housing and disparate impact. Could you uh, please just touch on and expand upon that? Because I think disparate impact Mm -hmm. is something that a lot of new investors probably A, have never heard of, and B, they completely do not understand that you as a property manager can be a lightning rod uh, for overzealous uh, advocacy groups. Yes. Uh, when you you do you do things with, that are good intention, but they're not across the board. So can you just expand on that? It sounds like you'll be able to explain it so much better than I would. So desperate impact. Um, first, let me just kind of explain what that is. That's a United States, basically a labor law that impacts not only housing, but employment. So it is one group of individu- individuals that are impacted Um, adversely impacted based upon rules or guidelines. So if I have a tenant that is a minority or a female, and I say, you know what, this house is going to take a lot of work. I don't want to um, rent to a female because she's not going to be able to handle it. She's not going to be able to handle all of this yard. That is a desperate impact to that individual. That is really um, a serious law, and it's a serious... um, complaint if it's brought against you, especially as it relates to fair housing. Now, and that's the thing, right? Because that's simple, right? That that should be, well, it, it should be, right? If, if you're watching this and that's not simple to you, that you, uh, as a landlord, can't be like, I don't want to rent to her because she's a woman. She's going to be more high maintenance than a dude. If you don't right. understand that that's probably an issue, you're an idiot. And, uh, you know, I think we all get that. That's, that makes sense. But especially with uh, the coronavirus going on right now, what can yes. happen, guys, is that's clear cut. That's black and white. Don't be a dumbass and you'll be fine with that. But what can happen is if, um, you know, you have X amount of tenants and you help out some of them right now because you're trying to be a good person. You're thinking with your heart and you're like, oh, man, coronavirus is rough. I'm going to try to help these people out. And you help out X amount of tenants in your portfolio. But then there's like another group of tenants who didn't get help from you. You need to make sure you've dotted your I's and crossed your T's uh, and had a legitimate black and white policy as to why you help those tenants out. Because you'll get an overzealous advocacy group who may try to make a disparate impact claim against you. Maybe five of the people in the group uh, of tenants you didn't help out, maybe they were black or maybe they're Hispanic. Or maybe they were men uh, and some of the people that you did help out, maybe they were women and maybe you're only helping out women or you're only helping out white people or, or any, any fair housing guideline you can have. See, there's going to be patterns that emerge uh, that you, because you're just trying to help people and you didn't notice, you didn't even think, you just consider all people the same. You're a good intention landlord and you're not thinking about sex, race, religion, any of that jazz. You're just trying to help people. But if you don't do it by the book and have a policy to explain that, you may accidentally trip into one of these lawsuits, correct? Absolutely. And that's so important. That's why we say, whatever you do, make sure that you have criteria set and you follow that throughout the entire process. So if you are waiving late fees, if you are um, deferring rent, make sure that you set your criteria and that you stick with that. And you hear these stories and you say, you know, yeah, she has three kids and, you know, we want to help her out. But this single guy on the other side, no, he can go out and mow grass. He can go figure out something. You can't do that. You really have to make sure that you're following the same guidelines for every tenant. And you can have guidelines in place, even if you are, 
making exceptions. Exceptions still come with criteria and guidelines in place. Yeah, that, that, and that's just like a great example, right? Um, you're just trying to help out or, you know, you get landlords and you'll hear it all the time. I see it on forums all the time, right? Uh, you know, investors will go onto these forums and they'll be talking like, hey, I had a tenant who didn't pay rent, but what they'll do is they'll start their story off. They'll explain like, there's this nice little old lady. She's 95 years old. And this is what happened. And, and they preface their entire story with the fact that she's just this nice little old lady. Look, I get it guys. You're out there. And, you know, I, I, I'm a, you know, I'm a white dude, right? I'm a, you know, relatively well-off white dude. I am not uh, the most sympathetic person out there, right? So I, I don't think a lot, if I was having a hard time, I don't think a lot of people out there in the world are gonna be like, oh yeah, I feel bad for James Wise, right? People watch my show, you guys see the comments. I'm not a super sympathetic guy. I'm not as sympathetic as your granny, right? You know, everyone has this place in their heart for their, their granny and that makes sense, folks. Um, but what CJ is really trying to explain to you is, you can accidentally trip into a disparate impact situation where maybe some of the tenants that you didn't help out because they weren't little old grannies or they weren't the single mother of three, uh, you know, maybe they get one of those amb ambulance chasing attorneys and, and they come after you for that. You better have a written policy in line that shows that you're not favoring grannies or single mothers over uh, you know, unsympathetic, uh, upper middle class white guys. Uh, yes. we as landlords have to be completely on the straight and narrow. We can't, um, what am I trying to say? CJ, I'm just trying to say like, we have to do this without emotion, even when it yes. feels like emotion is the compassionate thing to do. Right. And you can, and you can have emotion as long as you have structure with that. You can say, you know, I really, really understand where you're coming from. Unfortunately, this is our criteria. One more thing I wanted to add was that anytime a landlord that you're putting something in writing, anytime that you're sending an email blast out or letters to your tenants, just be really careful of your wording and your verbiage. Make sure that you are in compliance. Make sure that you're not saying anything in those letters because I've seen a lot of them flying around lately that can get your get yourself into some trouble. Well, can you expand on that? Like, well, can you give me an example or two of specific things that landlords have said in some of these letters you've seen online uh, that would, you know, run a follow fair housing or something yes, else of that. Absolutely. Nature. I've seen some that have come across that say things that are threatening. So for instance, um, you know, we understand that there's an eviction, but we're going to just go ahead and cut off utilities or we're still going to come out and put you out because we have to run a business. Those are things that you don't want to say, you don't want to write, and you don't want to give um, those type of threats to individuals. There are laws that protect us as landlords, and we will make sure that we are following those processes and making sure that we take advantage of those laws that protect us, but just not making idle threats that can be used against us, even, um, even if not in law, just as a perception of your company kind of being jerks. Well, absolutely, and, and you know that, that, that's a huge thing, guys. There's a lot of you out there right now uh, that maybe you're just like super small time landlords and you've been chugging along and maybe you haven't dealt with a lot of tenants who are not paying their rent. And right now, more than ever, you're dealing with tenants not paying their rent and you're having a hard time figuring out how to handle it. And maybe, you know, you've lost your own job too. And I understand you're trying to feed your family, but it's very important to understand your landlord tenant laws. Guys, I can't think of a state in the United States of America uh, that self-help evictions are legal. And that's what she was referring to. When you actually go out there and say, hey, even though the courts are closed, we're going to turn your power off or we're going to change your locks. Or, you know, mm -hmm. I've even heard of landlords super gluing locks, yes. things of that nature. Those, the, that's what's called a self-help eviction. Doing any of those actions or threatening to do any of those actions, to my knowledge, is illegal in all 50 states. Now, I know there's going to be some freaking jerk off on on yes. youtube out there right now like no i live in blah 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 county of blah 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 state we could actually all right maybe you know outside of like one or two random counties in the country that, that i'm unaware of it's possible but more or less if you're watching this show right now i i would venture to guess that 99.9 percent .9 of everyone watching this show right now you do not have the legal right or authority to, to do a self-help eviction. Right. So you are just going to burn yourself yes. by making rash decisions like that. Anything else you're seeing in these letters, CJ? 
Um, no, I think that's just about it, but just understanding that we do have rights as well as landlords and that we just need to take advantage of everything that's out there as far as the grants, the loans, contacting your local um, economic development um, groups if you were not able to get um, assistance from the federal level and just making sure that you play by the rules, you follow the guidelines and we'll all get through this. Rent Tech Direct provides you with an easy to use yet robust platform for managing your properties, complete with its built-in reporting and accounting system that can be customized to fit your business. You can manage work orders and even accept them online from your tenants. You can also share work order details with tenants or owners if you wish. With Rent Tech Direct, you will also fill your vacancies faster than ever with the built-in marketing tools. Just enter the details of your property and Rent Tech will automatically provide you with a professional online website as well as syndicate them to popular websites such as Zillow, Trulia and Apartments.com to get your listing maximum exposure so it's rented fast. You know, you're watching this show right now, whether you are a smaller mom and pop landlord, maybe you got like one to 10 properties, maybe you have 100 properties, you know, you're a business owner, maybe U.S. Reeb is managing some of your real estate, maybe Holton Wise is managing some of your real estate, maybe you're managing some of your real estate completely on your own uh, in your, you know, your city, right? Maybe you're a fellow property manager watching this. Um, as we talk today, right, we're at the end of April. Just yesterday, it's April 17th right now, folks. Just yesterday, uh, it was announced that uh, they have exhausted all the small business loans, right? $350 billion, poof, that's gone. Two weeks, it's gone. Currently right now, we got Donald Trump uh, arguing with uh, you know Nancy Pelosi, right? Republicans and Democrats, they, uh, as I talked today, Friday, April 17th, they have not come to an agreement on fulfilling the next round of funding. I know they're trying to get $250 billion put back into that, um, but uh, that is, you know, it remains to be seen if there's gonna be any more money or resources. So we've talked about where the tenants can go and where they can get some resources to help them pay rent and the stimulus checks. But what about all those business owners out there, CJ, that are watching this? Maybe they didn't get their funding because the majority of Americans did not get their funding. Uh, what, what are some resources that those folks can do if their business is struggling? Because, hey, this isn't just one-sided, guys, all right? If you're a tenant and you can't pay rent, that's because uh, the person who owns the business that you're working at isn't able to operate. Well, a lot of our investors and a lot of the folks on the other side of that coin, they also are trying to, to support their families and they're having a hard time earning their income. So what are some resources available to them? Right, yeah, and, and yesterday, you know, I was looking at that and the SBA processed more applications in the past 14 days than they have in the past 14 years. So we, that money was gone quickly. Um, that left a lot of individuals that maybe didn't have a huge CPA firm to go in quickly or a huge bank to get their funds taken care of, um, left them with nothing. But there are other resources. The resources that we hear a lot about, the PPP, the payroll protection, the um, EIDL, those are new. Those are things that are related to a disaster. The SBA has other loans and other programs that are not related to a disaster that a small business can um, tap into and get funding, get a loan. It may not be a forgiveness, but it's gonna be some cushion to help you get through these times. Um, there's also some local resources. Every single state, every single city has an economic development council, a program, and they have funds available as well. Um, every state has their own. So everyone's looking at the big money. Everyone's looking at the government and there's a lot of small money or mid-sized money that's kind of being left on the table because we're not tapping into that. So I would suggest anyone who wasn't able to get in and tap into the EIDL or the PPP to definitely pick up the phone today and call your local resources, call your economic development group with your local city or state and say, I need help. Tell me where I can go. They have all of the resources available. They have grant money that they've received from the government to help their own individual communities. Beautiful. And, you know, something else I want to touch on, too, I want to get your thoughts, because up here in Cleveland, we, we run a lot of properties on the Section 8 voucher program. Yes. And I know from working with you folks in, in Kansas City, Dayton, and Cincinnati, you guys also have a, a large amount of tenants in your portfolios on the Section 8 program. 
So mm -hmm. we've talked about what to do with all of our properties where we already have tenants in there who are, are having trouble and all the resources we can get. But I want to want to shift gears just a little bit here yeah. and talk about our vacant properties, right? Because, you know, every single portfolio is going to have properties that are currently vacant. Yeah. My advice right now to investors is if you have vacant properties right now, I would be very open and willing and, and diving as deep as I can into that Section 8 program. I know a lot of investors out there, they, they like to avoid the Section 8 program. And I understand there's a lot of uh, bureaucracy dealing with that program. Uh, but U.S. Reeb and Holton Wise, we happen to be two uh, large property management firms in the U.S. that are, I think are in the minority. Most property managers like to avoid Section 8 just because of the uh, additional red tape required. But I've always felt that the consistency of rent payments, especially when we get into neighborhoods that are a little more high risk or low income, mm -hmm. made up for all of that. And today, as I talk to you, with so many people uncertain where they're going to get their next paycheck from, I think investors uh, are going to be so, so well served uh, to really dive into this because that's just more yeah. government resources that, let's face it, are, are very needed right now. What are your thoughts uh, on that and what investors should do right now today with the vacant properties in their portfolio? Right. So this was, I've never understood um, when individuals say, you know, I don't want Section 8. To me, from, I'm not, you know, from a compliance and legal background, that's probably the safest you can get. Um, we can call up the Section 8, you know, their caseworker and say, this tenant is not taking care of their property. They're on the phone. They don't want to lose that Section 8 voucher. So you almost have an, another level that you can escalate to. I would suggest that anyone that has vacant properties right now be very creative. We're doing virtual tours. We are um, waiving application fees. We're doing a lot to make sure that we can still show the properties. The other thing I would say, pick up the phone and call your Section 8 office and say, we understand that there's a crisis. We have vacant properties and you have people that need properties. What can we do to work together? What can we do to expedite the um, inspection process? Because that's what a lot of landlords just kind of shy away from. We don't want them involved. We don't want them inspecting our properties. But you know what? The cities are going to the tenant advocacy groups. They're doing the same thing. So you may as well get that done in advance. You have a Section 8 um, person that you can deal with. I would definitely suggest giving them a call and saying, how can we make this work together? Special thanks to CJ from US Reeb for coming on and laying out a ton of the technical information for us. I know we're dealing with unprecedented times and a lot of this stuff is very confusing. Navigating this stuff as a small business owner is very difficult. Again, I want you guys to check out all the resources we've got in the show notes below. A ton of links and resources that CJ had mentioned are all down there. And if you guys have any further questions or concerns or, you know, anything, you're in a weird legal situation, you don't know how to handle it, drop those in the comments below. I'm sure CJ from US Reeb will be able to hop on there, make a couple comments, or if something is uh, serious enough, perhaps we'll bring her back, do another show. Uh, we're all going to try to get through this together. You know, Holton Wise, outside of some slight changes uh, dealing with the social distancing, like a lot of our non-essential field staff working from home offices like myself, uh, instead of the Holton Wise TV studio, we are very much still out there working, still putting properties under contract, still selling properties, still going in there and leasing units, renovating units, things of that nature. And U.S. Reeb, you know, we're up here in Cleveland. They're in Kansas City, Dayton, and Cincinnati. They are doing the same. So, you know, real estate is an essential business. There are some modifications uh, to how we operate those businesses, but more or less, both Holton Wise and U.S. Reeb are operating all systems of go. So if you guys are curious to know more about U.S. Reeb and their business, all their information is in the show notes below. If you're curious to know about Holton Wise and what we do here on Holton Wise TV, make sure you do yourself a favor and smash that subscribe button. That's all I've got for you guys today. As always, I'm James Wise with Holton Wise, and this is Real Estate Investing Made Easy.
Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on our latest content, including video tours and analysis of investment properties that are available for sale, real estate investment education, and our most interesting encounters with tenants from hell. Holton Wise, real estate investing made easy.